You are not skinny. I've seen photos of you and I can see your muscles popping through your shirt there. Do you have a problem with your pancreas side of cystic fibrosis? Do you take pancreas or tell me about that? No? Did you struggle with weight gain? Jeez, Jeez Anne, you're, you're making me fuss today. I know, um, sorry. <laughs> Welcome to The Princess of Possible, where you will hear some inspiring stories of people that have defied the impossible. My name is Emma Money, cystic fibrosis warrior, 2020 Australian of the Year, South Australian local hero, or as I prefer, the princess of possible. So today I am joined with a amazing cystic fibrosis warrior. I will say that with much entitlement to the, the title warrior. Nathan Charles is a amazing cystic fibrosis man in our community doing above and beyond amazing things. I wanted him on the show today because whilst it is called the princess of possible, I think that, um, you know, Nathan is making so many things that may seem impossible possible. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me on and, you know, and why, you know, there are times where I do consider myself a bit of a princess anyway, so <laughs> I think it's quite, I fit into this show quite well, so <laughs> thanks for having me on. I love that. All right, tell me for those that are listening, your your title because then that leads me into a lot of things. Nathan Charles, 33 years old, uh, born in Sydney, currently uh, living in Western Australia in Perth. At three months of age, was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. I guess at a, at a very early age, I, I, I had a very strong love for for rugby, and um, I wanted to be wanted to be a Wallaby. And in 2014, I managed to achieve my goal of representing Australia and living out my, my, my childhood dreams. So, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a 10 year professional rugby career, retired in 2018 from, from playing. And now I've actually transitioned into sports administration, still still rugby. Um, and now I'm the chief executive officer of uh, Rugby WA. So still very much a huge part of my life. And um, I, I love it significantly and it shaped who I am today. So yeah, I guess in a nutshell, that's sort of who I am. I've been had a very transient lifestyle. I've moved all across Australia and the world and lived in some amazing countries, states and whatnot, and just lived an incredible life. So um, wow. I feel like I've been on quite the journey and um, have some pretty avid stories that accompany that. Do you reckon you're a bit of a poster boy? Do you reckon you'd be on anyone's walls at home? Well, Emma, apart from the the, 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 the fantastic looks um, that I have, yes. uh, yeah, <laughs> I, jokes aside, um, no, I look. I, I would say I am um, from a sense of, I guess, uh, and like yourself, um, with sort of some of the things that we do, actions speak louder than words. And I'm a, I'm a big actions person. I'm not huge on social media or whatnot, but you know, having achieved what I've achieved, um, actually whether I like it or not, gives hope to people, whether their cystic fibrosis suffers or not. Yeah. Um, having having been the only person in the world to play an elite contact sport at an elite level with cystic fibrosis, that puts me in a, a, a bubble. Yeah, that's a, a, it's a whole other league, but, isn't it, in itself? It does. So naturally, again, whether I like it or not, uh, that puts me into a, a category, I guess. Yeah, you're right. I've been a poster boy. And yeah. some of the messages, some of the messages that I receive on a on a regular basis are of inspiration and hope and how much I've impacted someone's life. And I mean, those are those are not uh words I take lightly or take for granted. And I don't I'm not living my life any differently, but if how I choose to live my life has a positive impact on people and it actually can provide hope and inspiration, then, geez, like I'm in an incredible position. And to be fair, I have actually been told that I've been on, uh, been on a kid's wall. So I don't know how many people actually have posters of me up on their walls, but um, <laughs> look, I, I, I do receive extremely positive uh, messages on a regular basis. Yeah, that's amazing. I think you um, also become an accidental, you know, inspiration by your influence and, by you going about being you and, and what you're doing and what you love, you sort of, you gain that following of people who are inspired and motivated by, you know, you just living your life and, and how inspirational for others to see. Like you said, CF or not CF, it, it's pretty amazing. So I think I, I, maybe I'm a little, yeah, no, I think it's amazing what you do. I think it's so amazing to have someone on a, like you said, an elite level with sport, especially in rugby, it's not something that I think kids would think is possible with cystic fibrosis. 
So with your CF, tell me, I've asked a few people when I've had them on the show what their genes are. Now, what are you? Do you know? Actually, I have no idea. Yeah. So the last no one, <laughs> not many people know. And I, it's funny, and I asked that question because um, being, you know, within the community of my community, quite often I will have parents say, what gene are you? Because they think it will, um, you know, change how their child grows up and the treatment yeah. that they receive. And I just don't think the gene is relevant to the individual. No, I, 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 I'm de- definitely not Delta 508. I know that. I'm, I've got two quite rare genotypes. Yep. But I just don't know what they are. They're just yeah. numbers and uh, letters and they actually mean nothing to me or how I live my life. So, uh, Did you spend quite a lot of time when you were younger in hospital? Like what was childhood and CF like for you? No, it was my parents. My parents brought me up, uh, I guess, as normal as possible. And they actually, I, I remember, you know, having to go to clinic and go to hospital here and there, but um I was fortunate I didn't actually have any hospital stays when I was a kid. That that actually came as when I was an adult. But my parents actually, I, I never went to clinic as much as I possibly should have. I just... <laughs> I think we're all guilty for supported. that. We're sort of yeah. our own boss. Unless you need something, you're not going to go. We're not... Yeah, and I, I, like, I just, the whole, I don't know, there's a, a stereotype and whatnot and... Like I said, my parents, uh, we, we made a decision as a, as a family, or my parents did, I didn't really know any different, that it was something we were just going to handle um, as quite a close knit thing instead of sort of parading it around to any, everyone. So it yeah. was something that not a lot of people knew of when I was a kid. Is that a coping mechanism? Because um, you hear a lot of people even today won't talk about the fact that they've got a child with CF or someone with CF might keep it very quiet. And for me, I mean, I'm out there, I've got it, and everyone knows that. And I've never shied away or or dealt with it. And that we're all different, obviously. But I always wonder why people choose to do that and respectfully everyone does what is best for them. So I'm always interested, why? why? What did that do for you guys? Yeah, I think uh, when I was younger, back, you know, that's going, you know, 20, 25 years ago type thing, the research and the, I guess, profile of cystic fibrosis was considerably different to what it is now. So there was an easy way for people to stereotype, judge, and put you in a, uh, I guess, a, a corner. Yeah. yeah. And um, that was something we wanted to avoid. I guess also even to today, like I'm very comfortable talking about it because I know the positive impact it has. Mm. But I've, I've got a very corporate response and there's a personal response. And to be fair, the two differ significantly. Yeah. So speaking to someone, or speaking to people, speaking in this sort of forum, it's easy because I'm just talking about myself and what I've lived and um, people find, seem to find that quite um, inspiring. But actually when you talk it on a personal level, in particular with one, your mates, like I don't want to be viewed yeah. differently. So um, yeah. I'm living my life. Everyone's got their uh, adversity and obstacles that they're trying to overcome in life. This is mine and I deal with it. Yeah. But, you know, probably you, you, you're more you, your partner. I mean, there are certain things like having kids, um, nebulizers, medications, and there's a lot of questions. And when people don't know what cystic fibrosis is, mm. Scary. You just Google it. Yeah, you, you Google it and it comes up with quite a negative, um, there's quite a negative stigma attached to it. Yeah. In particular, um, for males with cystic fibrosis having kids, it's not an easy process. So then, you know, I've, I have been judged by, um, I don't want to just say women, but potential, you know, f- females in my life. Um, you know, I was once told that uh, someone made a sacrifice being with me because I don't know if they could have kids. And how um, horrible. I see it. So, you know, and stuff like that. And it, it, it is something that I don't openly just, you know, I meet someone and we go, oh, hey, um, I'm Nathan, I'm going to say yeah. Uh, yeah. Shut away. Then um, they go home and it Google it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is something that I um, just don't openly talk about in a personal way, but yeah. in a way what we're doing it today to inspire and provide hope and inspiration yeah. to people. I really enjoy this forum because it is a good story and it does have an impact and it is yeah. positive. So, but it does obviously, and you know full well, it comes with its negatives and its stigma and the things yeah. attached to it, which you just can't avoid. So it we get a, it's a good way that we can put almost a facade on. I remember being interviewed last year and 
I walked in. I'd just come from Pilates and had to go to a radio interview. So I was, you know, I was dressed. Um, it was a bit of a shock factor. But I walked in and he said, are you sure you've got cystic fibrosis? I said, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've got CF. And he was like looking at me, are you, are you really sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's why I'm here today. <laughs> anyway, we'd had a, a bit of a laugh and a chat. And then, the, after, you know, through the conversation, I realised I do put on and we do put on that profile. Like I talk about social media and, we, you know, I'm very active on there. But for someone that isn't, you're active in a social, uh, you know, in, in the limelight because of your career but it's a highlight and people don't see all the behind the scenes and like that personal side. So we can create this image or this story for people to see, yet they have actually got no idea as to what you go through. You know, you could go home and, you, you know, goodness knows what's going on behind the scenes. But like you said, if you can put on that story and it's not a, a fake story, it's your that element of your life, if you can give hope, inspire and, and encourage other people, that's a pretty rich feeling to be able to do that for other people. I think it's very important. It is extremely humbling too. And, and you know, I was told at a young age to, to build on my social media and whatnot, but it's, that's, that's just on me. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a, I'm, You're a blokey yeah, bloke, know. aren't you? Come on, look at you. <laughs> well, I've, I've, got a, I've got a soft side, man. Come on, I'm a big softy. I'm a mama's boy. Um, oh, yeah. No, I just... So yeah, big big mother's boy. Um, no, social media is just sort of not my not my thing, but I do get a lot of media attention, and you know I feel like my biggest impact is through more that corporate um, yeah. angle. It's it's raising awareness. Um, you know I've done a lot of public speaking, motivational, inspirational speaking, and that's where I feel like my niche is. Yeah, and I enjoy doing that. But it's rewarding, know, isn't it? It's nice to yes. be able to do that. Tell me, um, you're talking about being a mama's boy, so. Growing up, have you got siblings? Tell me about your childhood as far as just briefly, you know, family life and CF doesn't really sound like it negatively impacted you too much as a kid or correct me no, if I'm not wrong. At all. Not at all. Uh, I've, got, I've got an older brother. Um, it probably impacted him more, to be fair, because, you know, being diagnosed at three months of age, you now mum and dad, you know, you've spoken openly about this and I've had pretty deep conversations with mum. You know, they had no idea what it was and I know mum went through a so mum told me her and dad went through a significantly challenging time uh, finding out because, you know, the doctor said you're not going to, you know, enjoy the time you've got with him because it's not going to last long, probably won't make it past 10. Wow. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty, um, you know, yeah, it's really fun. So I think they really did try and, you know, live every day like it was my last. And unfortunately, I think my brother got pushed aside a little bit and I got a bit more attention. So, and then, you know, they, they, they have those uh, realisations which we've had conversations about and I still still rub it in and I'm the favourite. So yeah. um, see if or not, see if or not <laughs> uh, I'll use whatever it takes to be number one son. That's funny. I love that. I always say I'm the chosen one being adopted. It's like, you know, they chose me. So I can appreciate, I think, CF, we do get a lot more attention whether you want it or not. You just, that's just what happens. And I think we're all really cheeky, whether, I don't know. And I say, again, I don't like being put in a basket of, you know, of CFers because we're not, like we've all got names and lives and who we are. But I do truly believe that we all have some sort of blood cell maybe that has a really cheeky element because I've never met a CF that doesn't have a cheeky smile or is mischievous and you clearly have that as well, I can see. Um, I yeah. do have to, I'm going to hit on the, I'm going to talk to you about this because people that are listening can watch us talking and this video and notori men are notoriously known and girls, men and women, I should say, with CF to be skinny. Like we're known that we can have, you know, three, four cheeseburgers. Um, for me, uh, many people with CF look skinny and, um, and struggle with that. And then from not having enough weight means you get, you're more prone to infections and whatnot. You are not skinny. I've seen photos of you and I can see your muscles popping through your shirt there. Do you have a problem with your pancreas side of cystic fibrosis? Do you take pancreas or tell me about that? No. Did you struggle with weight gain? Jeez, Em, you're, you're making me flustered over here. I know, um, sorry. <laughs> geez, I, I think I need this sort of, um, this is this pep talk every day. You, I'll um, pep you talk you every yeah, day. Probably. <laughs> Look, um, yeah, yeah, notoriously, as you said, um, CFs are quite notoriously skinny and underweight. And actually, funny story, when I was a kid, my CF doctor, Peter Cooper, told my mum that 
I was I was too small and needed to put on some weight. So mum said, well, how do I do it? And he said, high fatty, salty foods. Obviously, with CF, it's, um, it's hard with digestion and also the salt um, issues. We, we secrete salt a lot easier and, and a lot more so uh, with the salt deficiency. Mm-hmm. And I was very active as a kid. So my, I think I had Maccas every day for the next <laughs> sort of couple of months. And I came back, my next, my next uh, visit, Doc goes, yeah, I think you've overdone it. So uh, <laughs> I put it a bit away. I was a little chub stuff by the end of that. But Thanks on, to on, a serious, <laughs> on a serious note, though, yeah, I, as a, uh, growing up, I didn't have issues with digestion. Yeah. But I actually, in the last couple of years, I've actually uh, developed issues with digestion. So now I do take um, pancreatic enzymes. Yeah, okay. And that's probably been one of the biggest shifts and challenges for me um, personally. I tend to drop weight quite easily. Mm-hmm. Once I've been playing rugby, I'd actually lost 14 kilos. Wow. Um, and it wasn't for trying. It was just I... Uh, struggled so much to put on weight that I was constantly eating and it was a real challenge to keep on, keep that weight up. So when I finished playing, I just ate to my appetite yeah. and the weight cut off me just like that. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, obviously still try and keep fit and keep in shape and whatnot, but, yeah, um, yeah I The pancreas would have been a diet. shock. Yeah, I do have some digestive issues now and um, it's probably been one of the biggest challenges in the last couple of years. It's um, funny hearing you say that because I've grown up and in my head, my spiel is, you know, I'd have 60 pancreatic enzymes a day and we've got very different childhoods. I grew up a lot in there. So I remember having competitions with with the other kids in the hospital at the time who could swallow the most pancreas. Now, it's not normal to swallow 20 pills. And then when we all got spoken to that, it could actually cause long-term damage. You know, pancreas is nothing. I could still swallow 30 tablets in one gulp, no water. So I think I'd, uh, I'd give you some a few Please. tips there. Yeah. I'm pretty good at that. Um, but tablets become, yeah, it's quite confronting when you like don't have to have something like that and all of a sudden your invisible illness becomes a bit more visible, whether it's to you or to people around because when you're out, you know, you have to have those tablets and you can hide all the yeah. nebs at home and, you know, you don't have to show all that. And I don't know for a male in particular, especially yourself with, um, I'd imagine you've been in such a male environment with, with your uh, career you, I mean, would you pull out and do nebs in training? And like, I, I'm, I'm picturing, you know, you. I would need to do a neb, not as much anymore, but you need to do that to be able to just have a bit of breath. You would have undergone so much. How did you manage treatment in that angle? Yeah, no, I, I, I managed it very privately at home um, and the guys actually didn't know about it. It was actually a funny story and I'm not going to go into the extreme detail, but essentially... <laughs> Here we go. Uh, this, this is a G-rated. This is a G-rated show. But <laughs> I, I was ta- I was travelling in South Africa one uh, one year earlier in my career, and we travelled with a team doctor. Um, and I said, uh, of a morning, I'd take and pull pull my pills. You know, we're staying in a hotel, so in my room had a, just a little coffee mug. Put all my pills in the coffee mug, and I'd take it down to breakfast, and I'd sort of take them as I, as required during brekkie. And the doc comes across, and he goes. Nathan, are you sure you want to be taking that in front of everyone? I go, I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? He goes, well, um, that drug is, um, <laughs> oh, look, it's, got, it's out there now. He what goes, is look, that drug's um, actually for STIs. And oh. I, was, I was quite a naive. I was, I was quite young. I think I was 20 years old. So I was like, I actually didn't. I was like, what's that? So I was very naive and then, uh, he, uh, I said, oh, no, I take it because this, this is azithromycin, so it's an anti-inflammatory for the lungs, but apparently it crosses over as um, a, a medication for STIs. STIs as well. Wow. So, and, and I said, oh, no, I'm taking it for this reason. He just goes, oh, okay, because he didn't actually know. <laughs> oh, no. So, um, I, from then, now, I thought that was quite a funny story. I don't know. It's yeah, that, no, I love that. If you want to cut it out of this, I totally get it. But um, no, I've never, uh, I've never heard that oh, that is what that is also used for. Learn something new every day. Exactly right. So I, I was kind of like, well, there you go. Living so your best was, single was, life, I bet. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was it was actually quite funny. But then on a on a more more serious note, um, when you say talking about it being a male dominated environment and talking about stuff like this, yeah, it was actually when I was nineteen. I was down at Brumbies. 
the and we talked uh, you know, I, I spoke earlier about keeping it very close knit anyway so i was at university i was at a tutorial one day and i get a phone call from the coach at the time and he said oh mate i've heard you've got ms and i was like oh what's ms i don't know what that is he goes multiple sclerosis i said no no i don't have that i got to see it cystic fibrosis and he goes okay monday morning come into the office let's have a chat so you know i, I sort of walk into the office towel between the legs and um, not knowing what's going to happen. And I, I, at this time, I'm kind of feeling a bit judged. I never really spoke about it publicly before this point. Mm. And he just said, mate, why, why did you not say anything? I just said, oh, because it's private. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be discriminated against. I'm here because I want to play rugby and um, I want to succeed based on my talent. And I, I, don't want, I don't want anything to get in the way. Yeah. He said, well, mate, we're a family. We're here to help you. And you are here based on your talent, nothing else. So let's let's get an action plan. Let's talk to the doc. How can we help you so you're in the best shape so you can perform at the best level? Wow. So that gave me a lot of confidence and support. And he said, I think you should tell the team. And I just said, oh, shit, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And, uh, you know, I mean, being a rookie, um, there were people in that squad that I looked up to from a kid. How many people are in your squad? Sorry, let me interrupt you there. Oh, how many people? Uh, it was a squad of about 40. Yeah, right. So this is a, a group of men, and you can tell me who was in that in a minute, but this is a group of men that didn't know you had cystic fibrosis. You've been playing at this level of rugby with them, and it's now you're 19 and you're having to go and almost tell them that you have CF. Um, yeah. Tell me tell me who, how that made you feel and who was in that group of people and, and how did you do that? How did that go? Yeah, so um, like I said, there was, you know, Rocky Olsen, Stephen Moore, Matt Gio, um, Hugh Ed, and some, some pretty high-profile people. And, um, you know, I, I actually did a presentation this day before. Um, it was the day before we broke up for Christmas break. And I actually did a presentation, and I actually remember this so vividly, getting up in front of 40 oversized, um, eight, basically, kids, you know, in that environment, it's it's really funny. Like it's almost like a childcare um, for <laughs> overgrown adults and oversized adults too. Um, and so, you know, this young this young pup's getting up, and you just I just remember getting these looks going, "What is this guy doing?" Um, as in, why is he getting up in front of to talk to us? Because yeah. as a rookie, you, you you just you sit quietly, you do what you're told, and you do all the shitters basically. <laughs> so I got up and I had this presentation sorted and then I couldn't get through the first line and I choked up and I started crying really? and I, I've never had that experience before in my life. And actually, fortunately, um, one of the older guys got up, put his arm around me and actually started reading my presentation until I, until I got myself together. Then I took over and then um, after that presentation, I, had, I made it clear to everyone that I didn't want sympathy and I just want to be judged on my own field and the person that I am, not this. And, you know, I had all these guys come up to me afterwards and said, Nathan, mate, respect. You've got that from everyone. If there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're still going to be the 19-year-old rookie. We're still going to push your face in the dirt and still going to do all the shit. So don't stress about that. (laughs) Exactly what you still needed to probably hear. Um, exactly right. So was that, was that, that was a really pivotal moment in my life in terms of the CF and coming out and talking about it. Yeah. Um, and just the, the impact it then had and then the impact I could see it would have in particular with the rugby community but also the profile that I was, you know, got later on in life in my career as well. So from that perspective, that was a really pivotal moment in my life. It's like, it sounds like as well, the coming out of, of having CF almost would have been a weight off your shoulders that you didn't even maybe know existed and knowing that you had that support. So, you know, I don't know that that you could even imagine that that would have been how, how the response was and how humbling for you to know that, yeah, you're it's actually okay and, you know, you've done it all on your own in there because of who you are and, and whatnot. I think that's amazing that you had that support. Did you ever undergo intravenous treatment or anything like that? I don't know. You don't, you know, whilst you were having, yeah, going through your career, did CF really impact your career as such? Yeah. yeah. It was something that I never let it impact. Mm. Um, But, yeah, the first time I had to go intravenous was maybe five, six, seven years ago. And it was, yes, I was being pretty, pretty lucky 
and it was the middle of pre-season and um, I was not in a good way. I think I started to cough up blood and I was really chesty and I went into the uh, to clinic and they just said, look, I think you need to come in intravenous. And so I was pretty scared because that's pretty low point for me, knowing yeah. that I'm not that well. And, yeah, I had to go speak to my coach <clears throat> and say, look, uh, this is the situation. I need to do it. And I'm basically going to be incapacitated for the next two weeks. He just said, go for it. No worries here. Mm. We support you. Mm. But there are a lot of questions because obviously then you have a bloody... Um, Get you drip in. And, and it's not just yeah, two so weeks I, either, is it? Because you've got the drugs in your system. Like, they're so strong. So it's kind of you've got yeah. a couple of weeks leading up to being sick, then you've got the actual treatment, and then another couple of weeks of letting it all come out. It's kind of almost like a six-week process of being... CF sick because you would have noticed yeah. it probably in your performance as you were deteriorating, getting that little bit sicker. And I hate talking and yeah. saying we're getting sick because this is just, there's always going to be bad times with the good. And, you know, it's about, I love being able to sort of say or, and listening to you, you know, you hit that point, you've gone and had your tune up, you needed to, and being able to accept and acknowledge that you're actually sick and you need to actually let CF interrupt your life more than you probably have ever let it before, um, it would have yeah, had quite an impact. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. It was, I've got a lot of questions too because obviously you've got, a, you've got an IV connected and you've got cords coming out of you and then I'm coming back to training and I'm trying to do everything I possibly can so I'm on the bike trying to keep fit because you can't do much stuff with upper body. I'm, I'm doing single single arm bench, uh, dumbbell bench press with my other side and <clears throat> trying to keep as uh, active and fit as possible because, you know, your body is, uh, uh, being an athlete, your body is your tool, yeah. tool you trade. So, uh, and two weeks is quite a long time to be uh, stationary in, in, in this, in that role, no capacity. So I tried to keep it fit and do it as much as possible. And, you know, I was really lucky. I, we've got, we, we had incredible resources in terms of SNC coaches or whatnot. So uh, yeah. we were very agile and flexible with what we did and how we did it. But, yeah, that was one time. And the other time was actually when I was in England. Uh, notoriously, the weather in England is just fantastic. So um, I played in this game and it was that wet and cold and miserable. And the week leading up to it, I was just not feeling great. But I got out there and I could only last half a game. I was just struggling to breathe. I was coughing and I just felt absolutely shattered. Um, and that was the one time in my career where I was actually going, you know what, I'm not in a good state here. I don't know if I can keep going. Wow. Naturally, in your mind, in your mind you go, no, you pony up and um, keep going. get on there and keep pushing. But I was just, and it, it was quite noticeable too, I was just absolutely shattered. And I spoke to the doctors at half time and said, you might need, uh, I'm, I don't know how much more I've got in me, um, so just be aware. And, um, you know, naturally through performance you can see, so they sort of kept on, you know, the last another couple of minutes after half time and came off. And that was the one time I was just like, I'm absolutely shattered. Mm. And, um, Especially when yeah, you're over there. Yeah. You're not in your home. Yeah. Um, that makes me think why you're saying, like obviously you said before you've travelled quite a lot. Obviously that was with the team I'm imagining. You guys, you did a lot of travel with within your career. So a lot of people, and this is a bit of an outside question to the rugby, to your career, you as a person, because of the CF side of it, you didn't actually, I mean, if anyone wants to travel and they've got CF, you've got to take tablets with you on the trip and there's all things that you've got to go through. How did you do that? You know, um, thankfully the team knew that you had CF, I'm imagining by this point, when you did your yeah. first big trip, everyone knew. Um, but how did you manage, you know, the if you got sick when you're overseas? And I say if because there's always a you might catch this bug or you've got to do this. Like what were there plans in place? Were you ever treated any, you know, had that special treatment just in case? Were you nervous? <laughs> no, I wasn't nervous, but yeah. um, I always uh, had it. Oh, 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 oh. The doctors were very uh, cognizant of the fact and they always said before we travelled, do you have enough medication? Do I need to order anything else? And they always had it spares just in case. Yeah, okay. So I was very fortunate in that regard, but I always said to them, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, just let me crack on and do my thing. I know how to look after myself. So there was a lot of trust. I'd go to them if I ever needed anything, but no, I was, I was always good. Um, I was very lucky, again, had very, very solid resources, um, if yeah. anything. I was probably better than anyone just an individual traveling on their own. But 
uh, I was notoriously known for my bag always having the rattle because uh, <laughs> they, people knew it was my bag because you could probably hear the amount of medications rattling around yeah. in the bag. So <laughs> took, up, took up a fair bit of space. So we used to do like three, four-week tours as well. So you go on for quite a while. So naturally um, your bag's full of medications. Or, yeah. Or well, yeah, you have to, don't you? Like, I, rem- like, I remember from travelling having to have a couple of weeks of um, antibiotics as a backup in case you got sick when you were over there, you kind of were ready to go and could treat yourself a little bit. But I think it's funny, um, and I always i am going to hone it back in in the sense of being the princess of possible. You called yourself that. So (laughs) CF has never defined you whilst it's been, you know, a big part of you. It also sounds like you've been pretty... I say lucky really loosely, but lucky with CF in a way that, you know, lucky for you, CF is an invisible disability that, like, you know, you said when you have now recently taking pancrease, it slowly becomes visible and then the mental side of it can really play an effect, you know, negatively. How have you managed when you've had, um, because I would assume you've had times where you've also been quite negative about things because we're all allowed to not be okay at times. How have you dealt with, things when it's negatively impacted you? Uh, probably only recently I've learned a lot more how to deal with my emotions better. For so long I never let certain things impact me and I was, I, I, I have a, and, a, and I don't know whether this is um, from being in a high performance environment for, you know, majority of my life or whatever, um, but I've, I've had an ability to compartmentalise issues mm-hmm. and not that it impacts my overall goals. So. Quite Sometimes that means you don't actually deal with you don't deal with issues, but in the same sense, am I? People have views on everyone. People are very judgy, and and uh, I don't know. Again, an ICG about it. But I just do not care. Yeah. I don't care what someone thinks or says or whatever. Because at the other day, we've all got challenges. This is one of mine. One of my many, but. Who cares? It makes you who you are, what you are, and you know I wouldn't be the person I am today without some of the adversity that I've that I've faced, and um, ultimately wouldn't have the resilience that I do without having faced those challenges. And that's something I'm extremely proud of because I do generally believe in life that you can achieve whatever you want if you put your mind to it. Yeah. And the body, the body's done. I've proven that. I've pretty much broken every part of it, and you, it'll push through whatever you tell it to push through. So that's the power of the mind, and that's one of the messages I try and get across to people when I do my talks is positive mindset is incredibly powerful because... If, I, if someone tells me, go do this, then I, I think, well, yeah, that's possible. For example, uh, I'm going to throw this out there. I did 60 to 65 kilometres on the treadmill, 65 roses on Saturday. Mm-hmm. I did a bit, of, a bit of fundraising for that. Mm-hmm. Didn't train for it. Someone said, oh, I'm going to do this. And I was like, yeah, I got it. I'll do that. Tell me in quarantine, what else am I going to do? 65 kilometres is a long bloody way, and especially for someone that's, you know, 100 kilos and um, hasn't trained for it at all. So... You know, and I went through some really pain points there. I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. And, uh, yeah, that's did you just do it? how my positive mindset. And I, I did it. I was in a lot of pain, still recovering. But, um, did you just say yeah. you're 100 kilos? Yeah. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. You I are am. double I my weight nice. almost. I'm not, I couldn't, I struggle to get to 60 kilos. I'll eat double cheeseburgers with meat cheese only add bacon barbecue sauce and I, you know, I still can't hit that. Um, there you go. So yeah. <laughs> very different. It's, but it's different. The body, like you said, the bodies are so different and I agree. I think it's mind over matter big time and it's how we perceive, uh, you know, how we, th- we, we as individuals, you know, see things. And if you know you're capable of something, then you become unstoppable. If you, yeah. you know, sometimes you just got to go hard and it will go home really, don't you? At the end of the day. Yeah, just Anything is possible, right? You were on Ninja Warrior, a TV show, and I watched you on that, and it was amazing. Tell me about that experience, because that's pretty cool. From a you know, again, you're an athlete, but tell me about Ninja Warrior. Well, you wouldn't have had to watch for too long because I didn't make it. You didn't make far, it, no. So, um, <laughs> you got yeah, a lot of promo actually, though. <laughs> it was, it was, um, it was actually awesome. Love the experience. That was actually just after I retired, so I was a lot heavier. Um, at that stage, and I actually tore my lat six weeks before the competition. So I um, actually training. 
for it. So I was in a pretty average um, way, but it was just the experience was unbelievable. It was yeah. so much fun. And I was, I was, I've never been so nervous. Well, actually, probably the last time I was that nervous was running out in front of 80,000 people um, in a test match against the All Blacks. So um, I was pretty nervous, but it was just exhilarating. The adrenaline it was just amazing. And it was just an incredible experience to go through. And yeah. I wish people, uh, more people had that opportunity. I'd love to do it again. Yeah. Um, Good. Keep me on for the next one. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was just a cool experience. The whole setup, even just participating in it and just being around it and the excitement from other people as well. Yeah. So, and I made some friends from that, which I, I still speak to today. But um, oh. yeah, yeah that was great. It looks it like fantastic. an amazing once in a lifetime sort of experience. But hey, you are lighter now. You said you were quite heavy then. So when they get up for the next show, maybe they'll get you on there and. You might actually make it past five minutes or oh, five seconds. Uh, five, five, yeah, I was going to say five minutes. Jim. Five that's, minutes that's, was uh, <laughs> No, you did well. well. Um, tell me, while we're talking about, you know, what, you know, the possible things, what now, obviously you retired. Did Why did you retire? I just want to touch on that quickly. Yeah, it was a combination of things, but ultimately um, my body broke down and I started to lose the love of the game. I was trying so hard. You know, 2014 was my prime year. Mm -hmm. Made my my Wallabies debut, was starting for the Wallabies. Like I was at the top of the top. And as a kid wanting to achieve that goal, I reached it and I was at the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, in one of the test matches, I tore my pick off the bone and... um, that was my season done, and ultimately that was my last ever test game. Yeah, okay. um, and I struggled to come back from that. Then following that, I had a shoulder reconstruction. I had a number of head knocks, and uh, at the time, um, I was married and I was living away from my wife for a significant amount of time. And uh, you know, I just uh, I woke up one day and my body was sore, and I just thought, oh, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, that would have been a hard realisation. Yeah. It was really hard. It was really hard. Um, I was 29, I was still young. Like, I'm 33. I could still be playing from an age perspective, but I just I couldn't I just couldn't do it anymore. Couldn't put yeah. myself through the pain. My body hurt. Um, mentally, I was absolutely exhausted. Um, it was just impacting my, my personal life. And, yeah, it just... It's like you hit your peak. Really You've hit your peak, which is amazing. You got to, you know, it sounds like you worked your entire life. Rugby's been such a big part of your your entire life, obviously. And now you said you're working in um, working for the rugby association. Rugby WA, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This so this leads into what I sort of, you know, what does it look like for you future wise from a career aspect? Obviously, you're doing what you're doing, but tell me where do you see yourself in the next, you know, five to ten years? To be honest, I just want to be happy. I know that's a bit cliche, but um, whatever I'm doing, I want to be enjoying life. Um, ultimately, yeah. I, uh, you know, five to ten years, I'd love to have a family, mm-hmm. settle down and have someone to share that with. Mm-hmm. From a career perspective, you know, I, I, I'm very ambitious and I'm very driven. Um, and I'm, you know, currently in a CEO role, but I, I'm not done there yet. I really want to make and do the best for rugby in this organisation in Western Australia and leave it in a better place, which I feel like I've achieved a lot so far but yeah. I want to keep going and ultimately you know, sport's been a massive part of my life and I want to keep progressing in that field and you know, challenge myself uh, I think the day you stop challenging is the day you stop growing and uh, you know I've got plenty of growth left to go in my life and um, it excites me um, a lot so yeah you know, I, I really like the executive life the corporate executive life it's mm-hmm. challenging and it's great fun and it's, it can be very rewarding so I'm going to cut you off because you just said fun. What do you do for fun? Rugby is obviously career, you know, you love it, but what do you do for fun? How do you switch off? It's a really good question. I struggle with that. I play golf. I keep active. Yeah. I work out. I go out with friends, go out for dinners, lunches. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy quite a social scene. I just love having fun in terms of getting around the boys and having a laugh and being silly. Do you like beer? Um, What's I, your favourite beer? I, I, Oh, just beer. <laughs> Are you a beer drinker? Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an anything kind of guy. Depends what mood I'm in. If it's a hot day, yeah, I'll put down put down a beer or two. But if I also really like nice red wine over dinner. Um, <laughs> Bit of bubbles. On a hot day, I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll dabble with bubbles. I'm not too precious. So, um, <laughs> I, say, yeah, I, love, I, I love that because, you, you know, you're human still at the end of the day. I think we're too often judged for 
I remember having a glass of wine and someone going, are you sure you should be drinking with, with what you got? And I'm like, it goes back to exactly what we were talking about at the beginning. Too many people have an opinion and you get put into this basket. And I wanted to create the princess of possible to show that we are not any different. We're all human. Anything is possible. And just because mm. you've got something, whether it be CF or not, it does not and should not define you nor how you live your life or what you do or where you're going to be mm. later on in life. You just, you know, make the impossible possible, I say, because like you said, yeah, well, you didn't say this, Disney did, but I just thought of it. If you can dream it, you can do it. But Well, Disney says that. I'm going to pretend that you said it too. <laughs> yeah. No. Like, well, I mean, the, the, the saying I have is believe you can do anything because you can do anything stopping you as yourself. Um, yeah. It's very similar. You know, it similar is. messaging, I guess. But, you it know, is. I've just, uh, I, truly, I truly believe that if in this world, if you want something bad enough, you'll do what it takes. Yeah. And if you don't succeed, it's because you want bad enough. That's just my, my view, and it's not exactly correct because there are some impracticalities around certain things, but... Um, no, I like that. Is, I guess. Um, my last question for you, Nath, is it's not even a really hard one. If you, I ask everyone, but if you were to go back to a time... I've said, you know, about 16 to some people. It depends. I just want you to think back to a time where CF has negatively impacted you perhaps for the first time where you thought, you know, that was not not it, but you were in a really, de- you know, bad place potentially. What advice would you give to yourself? I don't know. Things, I mean, you can, this could be so relatable to CF or just adversity in life is, you know, Tom Hill's, Tom heals all wounds or things yeah. will get better. I, I don't know. Um, I like just, that. Time I think, heals. I think, just, I think just stay positive. I, I, I'm the eternal optimist. At my, at my, at my peak, my peak self, um, I'm the eternal optimist and I always think of positive things in life. So, yeah, just stay positive. Yeah. Live life, have fun, put a smile on your face and um, just keep, keep going because uh, life's too short to worry about shit I guess it is and so, so is yeah. and I think like we you know I, we touch on it all the time but when your time's up your time's up so be here for the now and like you said life's short do that thing you think you shouldn't do and dare to be different all of that it's so nice that we can be leaders by accident and in, and inspirations by accident and I'm really grateful that you know you do what you do I know there'd be so many young kids that look up to you and you know, you are, it is inspiring and you are human at the end of the day, just living your life, but you're doing extraordinary things. And I do appreciate it. And I think keep doing what you're doing. And I look forward to watching what comes of you. Cause yeah, I feel like you got a little sparkle in your eye there and you know, yeah. Yeah. At, least you, at least you have good stories about yourself. Princess of possible, hey, there we go. Thanks for listening today. For more information on upcoming episodes, or you just want to check out what I'm up to, head over to my Instagram, CFMummy. Now I put it to you to go and make the impossible possible.